side. All right. I, uh, I'm going to open with a dumb joke. And I thought it was funny. Maybe you will. Um, so we will get to Matthew 20 in a second. But here's, if it's ready for me, here's my joke. Um, a Jewish man, a Hindu, and a politician were traveling together on a road. And uh, so they spent their day traveling as they got to the end of the road and were exhausted. They went and found a hotel. And so they inquired if there was room, and the hotel owner said, I have one room left, but it's only got two beds. Um, but I do have a barn out back, if one of you guys doesn't mind that. And uh, the Hindu fellow was very gracious and said, I got it, guys. I'll, I'll go to the barn. So the Jewish man and the politicians start settling into the room, and they're barely unpacking, and they hear a knock at the door. And it's the Hindu fellow, and he says, there's a cow in the barn. I can't sleep with a sacred animal. So the Jewish guy sighs and says, all right, all right, I got it. And so the Hindu guy comes in, the Jewish fellow heads out to the barn. And a few minutes later, another knock at the door. And the Jewish guy is back at the door and he says, there's a pig in the barn. And I can't sleep with an unclean animal. So the two of them look at the politician and he begrudgingly heads out to the barn. And um, a few minutes later, they hear another knock at the door and they open it. And it's the pig and the cow. <laughs> the pig and the cow. They won't share the barn with the politician. <laughs> All right, it's a stretch, but our passage is going to deal with um, people who resent each other. And may maybe our issue is, you know, I don't, I don't know that the three I listed are your issue, but is this issue, it's going to look at how we value each other on the basis of grace and the twist that our passage would bring is unlike our joke, the gospel and the community God builds, his church, should want all three of those guys. We would love to see all three of them come to faith in Jesus and fellowship with God's people. Um, even, and I know it's an election year, even the politician. We believe the grace of God is for all. So that, that's kind of where we're going, is we're going to look at God's grace. So here's our passage. Let's, let me just read through it. Um, it's chapter 20. We're going to look at verses 1 through 19. The whole chapter could have been taken altogether. Um, I want to break it down in smaller chunks for a couple of reasons. One, that's how I just originally broke it down. Two, it'll set us up to hit Palm Sunday at the right spot in Matthew, and that just seemed really cool. Um, but the whole chapter is on grace. And what I want you to think about as we read through this passage is God's promise is based on his own generosity and provision, not the worthiness of those he invites into his blessing. I know that's just saying grace again in like a really long form. But we want to look at how God's grace interacts with people. So here's, here's the story. Jesus is talking right here at the beginning of chapter 20. And he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I'll give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idly all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired the first hour came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, and have, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorched heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose 
with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. So this is this picture of, of the grace, and I, I hope you see where, where the language I've got on the screen is coming from. This is a picture of a master graciously providing, and, and it is a, a picture of his generosity. But the struggle for the people is this idea of worthiness. So where we are in the flow of Matthew, if you remember, we've had several themes going on for chapters, and we really... We haven't broken off from that. There's repetitions in here that connect it. And, I mean, if you remember back in 18 where we sort of started some of these conversations, it was the disciples arguing over who's the greatest, which this passage fits alongside that very nicely in answering the concern of um, competition and, and superiority within God's people. But it, it answers that question of who's the greatest actually in the same way that Matthew had addressed it right before that story. So 18, you know, the beginning of chapter 18 was the who's the greatest. Right before that was the story of Jesus and Peter having a conversation about the temple tax. And if you remember, Jesus makes the point that he doesn't owe the tax. He's Lord of the temple. And then he graciously and miraculously pays Peter's tax for him. So Jesus pays what he doesn't owe. So we already had, back in the end of chapter 17, this idea of God's gracious provision and even providing you know, beyond what people were owed. That was the backdrop that made chapter 18 so outrageous. The reason we know the disciples were just wrong when they start fighting chapter 18 is we just heard that this is a community where Jesus provides by grace. And they say, who's the greatest? And he's going, none of you deserve to be in the kingdom. That was the point. And so now we've circled back around to that idea of worthiness and God's provision by grace. We have a story about laborers who were hired at various parts of a day, but they all end up being paid the same thing. And the workers who work the whole day get upset and grumble because they assumed that they would get something. They assumed they'd get something more than what was promised to them. And so they become ungrateful for the initially good offer when they saw the master's generosity towards others. This is what I want you to catch. At the beginning, one denarius was viewed as a fair wage. And one denarius was a, a day's wage. So it was, it was a good offer. The master just reminds them that the pay is his to give. They hadn't been wronged. They just simply lost sight of grace and become entitled. That, that's the line that just going to zing. You lose sight of grace, you start becoming entitled. What began as a free offer, a free offer they deemed as good and fair, had become bitter to them, not because the offer had changed. The offer didn't change at all. But because they switched to thinking the offer was based on relative merit instead of generous promise. And so this passage is pulling a lot together. Verse 16, where it talks about, and the first shall be last, and the last shall be first, is a repeat of the last verse of chapter 19, 1930, ended with, the, last shall, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So this idea we've been looking at of God's grace is, is coming back together. Um, verses 17 through 19, where he foretells his death, is a repeat of chapter 17, verses 22 through 22, 23. So Jesus is pulling all the stories together that we've been walking through these last couple weeks. He's pulling them together as he gets closer to Jerusalem, because the, the backstory, the narrative that's tying this is we had the Mount of Transfiguration, and since then, Jesus has been going to Jerusalem. And he's been telling them all along, I'm going to Jerusalem that I, so that I will die. I will be crucified and I will be raised on the third day. And now we're on the cusp of Jerusalem. In just a, a little bit, he gets there, both in our church calendar and in our preaching calendar. And it's not just, he doesn't repeat these details because he wants them to know all the details. They go, oh, it's crucified, you know. No, he's weaving this into a preaching series. 
because he's trying to help them understand the meaning of what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. It's not enough that they know he's going to die and raise. Why must he die and raise? And he is tying that to the gracious provision of the master. Jesus is the gracious provision of God. And so the grace of the generous master, the faith that saves the unworthy children, it all comes together in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So when one of the last parables before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus helps his disciples see that the object of their faith needs to be the gracious promise of God, not in their accomplishment or merit. And so that's where we're going. Grace, God's promise is based on his own generosity and provision, not on the worthiness of those he invites into his blessing. So they look at this story that Jesus has constructed to make his point. There's a, there's a, we could, it's always a dumb, there's just a lot in here. But one of the things that struck me is I think helpful in, in dealing with this heart of ingratitude, the grumbling that comes in is their view on the work changes during the parable and that's what messes them up. And so the first thing I want you to catch is the work is a gift. The work is a gift. I think this is huge when you think about your service to the Lord. And I think this is the place where the laborers get off track. They weren't regular employees of this master. He doesn't start the day with them. They're not the foreman. They're not living on the vineyard. He goes out and finds guys who have no job and makes an offer. And it's a good offer, so they accept it. And so that's where they start. At the start, they're grateful somebody has given them a job. By the end, they're ungrateful with how he manages his business. Wait a minute. <laughs> By the end, they don't just want the pay that was promised. They think they're entitled to more. Why? I mean, is it their money? Is it their vineyard to allocate? They came in as day laborers thankful for the gig, and by the end of the day, they think they're the, the managers, that they're entitled to speak into how he runs his vineyard with his money. I mean, and that, I mean, that's the flow of the passage because that's the master's rebuke to them. They start grumbling and he says, do I not have a right to do what I choose with what is mine? He's just sort of saying, like, excuse me, whose money do you think this is? You forgot our relationship. And that's why you're grumbling. See, when we first become Christians, when you first come to Christ, the idea that God would use you is grace. You know you don't deserve it. I'm a sinner, worthy of wrath, and you would not only forgive me, but you would take me and use me, allow me to serve in your church and witness to my neighbors and give me gifts and passions. It's all grace. That's where you should start, and I think where most people do start. But just like the laborers in our story, there's a danger we can drift away from that mindset. From I get to serve, to what do I get because I served. <laughs> and we need to be careful we don't drift away from it. The fact that we get to serve God with our lives doesn't make us more worthy than anyone else. We're all sinners. Saved by grace is a gift. We all still need the same thing. The shed blood of Jesus to wash away our sins. And not one thing that you have done for the kingdom since you came to new, know Jesus can reduce the weight of your sin. Only Jesus can do that. As soon as you start messing with that, you water down the gospel. And I think it's an, it's an important motivational battle that we need to fight if we're going to have a vibrant ministry in our church. You need to serve in Christ's body. But you, it's, you get to serve in Christ's body. It's a gift come to you by the grace of Jesus. None of us belong here. None of us are worthy to do anything. But by the grace of Jesus, you've been adopted, brought in, and invited into his vineyard, into his work. And so helping with our services, investing in your fellow members, reaching out to the lost in our com community, showing the compassion of Christ to our neighbors are not activities for extra points to make you super righteous. No. When we do those things, we're just doing our job. 
We're not extraordinary. We're just grateful. We do them out of gratitude for and trust in God's gracious promise. That's why we do them. See, when you make Christian service about merit itself, then you'll decide whether or not to do things based on your personal sense of righteousness. Right? You'll say, well, I've put in a lot of hours already. I, I did my work. Um, or if I feel like I've got my life together, then I'll pass. I don't need to serve God because I don't need it. <laughs> Someone else can serve. And on the opposite side, when my family's in trouble or I'm wrestling with financial issues or health issues, then I'll be like, well, I better go sign up for something at church because I've got to earn me some blessing. No. 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 Both mindsets replace gratitude with entitlement and strangle the life out of our ministries and witness. Both are just, let me back up. We pick on other churches for preaching, we have this phrase, right, the prosperity gospel. And you can hop on TV and you can watch guys who will say, you know, put out your seed faith and God will give you a financial breakthrough. And, and it's all this merit game, right? And they play to your needs and faith is a way of earning the blessing and favor of God. And we can say, well, those guys are messed up. That's so wrong. They've wandered from the gospel. But we have our own versions of that when we play this game of acting like our service, our willingness to step up. And I'm not just saying service in the church. Service for Christ. I think the church is his body, so it definitely includes here. The idea that you earn something here, that doing this is for the breakthrough or for the, you know, that if I tithe, then I get the blessing. I, I have a Bible Monopoly game at home. And literally, if you have to tithe on everything you earn, and it goes into the middle. And if you're tithing, then when you land on their free parking, which they call blessing, you can get the blessing. But if you didn't tithe, you can't have the blessing when you land on that square. It's like, so it's just a financial transaction to earn God's blessing. So I've got a gospel issue with this. I don't tithe to earn God's blessing. I tithe because I've already been blessed. He saved my soul from hell. So I, from hell, all that I have is Him and so is His, and so I just give some of it out of gratitude. I'm not waiting for the blessing, and no, I'm serving out of the blessing. See, we, we we slip into this in in subtle ways. We don't say out loud. I believe in a, a gospel of earning God's favor, but then we do it anyway. I'll give you an example from my own life. Um, you know, Christy and I been married for five years. I've been in ministry for 22 years, which means the majority of my ministry experience was done as a single. I've only had five years of knowing what it's like to have her by my side and working together and, and all the fun that that has been. And in my single years, man, I can't tell you the amount of times a well-meaning uh, church member, usually an older lady, would come alongside me and say something like, Tim, you have served God so faithfully, and I am just praying that he has a great wife for you because you deserve it for the way you've served him. It sounds super spiritual, and oh, they're praying for me. But what does that mean? I earned a great wife? Does that, like, you level up and get better wives based on this, like... My relationship with Christy is founded on this. We knew and know that we are two sinners who needed the grace of Jesus. And that foundation has blessed our relationship. We need to come on the basis of grace. Can you imagine if I dated Christy trying to decide if she was the one that deserves me? I mean, would I got a second date with that attitude? I hope not. She's smarter than that. What is a great wife that you earn? Can you imagine trying to live under that pressure that apparently I've earned something that you have to measure up to? Every date you're wondering, are you good enough? Every date I'm, I guess, wondering if you're good enough too because I don't want to marry below my pay grade. I earned it. I mean, this is about as destructive to a relationship because it's all merit-based, it's all judgment, and it kills grace. And yet this was the good wish of conservative Christian churchmates for me. We slip into thinking that we're earning extra favor rather than ministering out of gratitude. As soon as you move down that road, it kills grace. I don't deserve Christy. What a gift I've been given. You see how grace changes our heart feelings? We don't labor to love each other um, 
to love each other well because we're trying to like squeeze some extra blessing out of God's hand. We love each other well out of our gratitude to the God for the love he's already lavished on us. Our marriage is a gift. So is our salvation and the lives we get to live for Christ and the service we do. It's all gifts. And so for us, I think when we remember the work is a gift that changes the motivation. You need to let grace inspire your service. You're not trying to figure out how to serve God's church, how to be a witness in your community, in your workplace, and to your neighbors to get something that striving to attain will burn you out. But if you're responding to the grace you've been given, that's a well that never runs dry. So let grace inspire your service. I'm saying don't be idle or proud. Don't do nothing and don't try strive to earn something. But humble service is what the gospel should produce in God's people. If you've become sidelined and complacent, pause to reflect again on your need of a savior. You know, let this season of Lent and this coming Easter holiday remind you of God's lavish goodness to you. He saved you into his family. What he has given you and your gifts and passions to do for him, that's all his generous grace to you. And if you, if you know you've been given much, serve him out of gratitude. At the same time, maybe you're one who has labored long, right? When we do a sign-up sheet, it's your name on every box. You got roles you just do and do and do, and you're feeling burnt out. Entitlement will do that to you. Because you're looking for an extra wage that wasn't promised to you. And then you'll be mad when it doesn't show up. I mean, that's what these laborers, that's their issue. They're mad they didn't get something that they were never told they were going to get. When we seek to serve Christ, we weren't promised that people would say thank you. Or that you'd even get rewards in this life for that service. See, when you serve others out of an expectation for return, frequent disappointment will wear you down. You know, if I want to go look back at 22 years of ministry, how many kids have I spent late nights helping them work through battles in their faith and driving them into the Word, and I don't even know where they live anymore? They don't call. There are no thank you cards coming in. And so if I'm doing it with an expectation of return, how long till I get bitter and quit? But if I'm doing it out of gratitude for Christ, I'm just glad I got to serve. I'm glad for that moment to serve my Lord. And they can go wherever they want to go. They can say thank you or they can don't say thank you. You know, Jesus heals a bunch of guys and only one comes back. That's sort of par for the course. And so if you're doing it for reward, you'll quit because he didn't promise you that. Let go of that. Jesus is actually enough. He's enough reason. And he's promised. He's made promises to you by the blood of the covenant and the vindication of the empty tomb. Remember your first love. And the work will get its life back. Who cares if no one ever says thank you or gives to you a return on your sacrifice? Jesus died for you. I mean, the pay's maxed already. Jesus then promised to be with you. When you get out and serve him in his field and his vineyard, you're in his house on his land with him on the property helping you. That's the pay. Be satisfied in Christ in your labors. Let grace inspire your service. And so when you're struggling with that frustration, that sense of being owed and not given, Go back to reflecting on the gospel and let that re-inspire you. So we focus on grace. We need to be inspired by grace. So then let's talk about what gets in the way of you doing that. What stifles you have in that grace focus? Well, one of the things that our passage points to, and I think there's lots of things that stifle grace, but here's the one that Jesus pointed out in this passage. It's comparison. The, the full-day laborers were happy until other laborers got hired. They start the day, master makes an offer, and they're like, let's go. And they jump in. But then the master keeps bringing in these other people, and other people are why they're not happy anymore. You know, if the wage was fair and the master was good and generous, which it all was, 
then why do the workers lose their joy? Why do they move away from grace? Why do we find it so easy to lose sight of everything I had said in the previous point? Comparison. See, the gospel talks about my absolute position in relation to God. An absolute truth thing. I'm a sinner, and I have fallen short of the glory of God. When I see myself that way, grace is big. God has reached across that chasm and loved me and saved me. And grace, when grace is big, gratitude is big. That's the standard, and I'm nowhere close to it. And in that light, grace is lavish. How can I not... How can I not be grateful? Well, I'll tell you how I can not be grateful. Just change the measuring stick. You change the measure, you change the gratitude. Comparison moves from that absolute standard of me having fallen short of the glory of God. Instead, I just see that I've fallen short of the glory of Dad, or Terry, or Lucy. Or, you know, if, if that's my standard... I just have to find one of you that's not doing as well as I am. Or even if you're doing better, you're not doing that much better, so I'm not so bad. I mean, I need to get up to where he's at, so I need a little grace, and I'm a little thankful to Jesus for that little help. Where's the gratitude? Where's the let me serve my life for you? And it, it just dies, because when my comparison shifted from the absolute standard of me before Almighty God to the relative standard of me and my neighbor. If I can measure off of other people, then grace gets small. Instead of focusing on how I haven't, you know, instead, on, on God's absolute standard, I just say, well, I'm not as evil as I could have been. Rather than realizing I was never as good as I should have been. Relative merit inflates my pride and kills my gratitude. I mean, maybe I need grace, but surely they needed it more. And this is for, for my team. Those of you who have labored the whole day, you came to Christ early. You skipped a bunch of really obvious vices. I don't need as much grace as that guy. It's easy to paint that picture when I work with relative merit. And then just think, so what do I get for my advantage? I'm a cheaper buy for Jesus. He needed less grace to get me. So I get bonuses, right? Maybe I need grace, but surely they needed it more. What's my advantage? When you keep your eyes on God and His grace, all you'll see is His goodness. When you start turning your head to the side and comparing it to your neighbor, you forget the Savior and you resent the sinners. Why is He here? Why is God blessing Him? Do you know what I've done? opposite of the gospel service rather than looking at that person and comparing yourself to them being envious and jealous of God's blessings to them thank God that he loves them and has blessed them that would be a gospel thing none of us deserved a thing you know so who do you look down on among God's people who are those people you're like why are they here they deserve less than me they're less than me I'm a better Christian than that guy do you have people, maybe in our church or even in the wider Christian community here in Lancaster County that annoy you? It feels like they get away with something that you don't and they get God's favor anyway and it annoys you, right? I mean, we're a little church. This is an easy complex for little churches to get to. We look at the big churches in town, right? And we get super critical. We harshly criticize them as though it's some travesty that they have so many people and we don't. Get your eyes off them. We're not here to compare with anybody else. It doesn't matter how God sees fit to bless other churches. It's all His. He can do what He wants. It doesn't matter how God sees fit to bless other churches, other families, other Christians. That whole mindset will suck the joy and grace right out of us. You want to turn us into a bitter, ugly place? That'll do it. Now, what we need to do is thank God for our salvation. 
Practice looking at him and praising his grace, giving thanks for what he's done. Thank God for graciously allowing our church to be here today. For each person that he's brought together today to gather under his name by his gospel. You know, after the, I'm going to make one more point, but after that, we're going to sing more songs. Maybe the easiest application of this message would be when we sing those songs, mean it. Allow the songs. We're going to sing about Jesus and what he's done for us. Allow that to recenter your focus and actually say, that's what I'm here for, is to give thanks for the gospel. Because when I give thanks for the gospel, I get my eyes on what God's doing in my life where I am, and I get my eyes off the relative comparisons that choke out grace and gratitude in my heart. Lay down those people and places that you compare to and fix your eyes on God's grace. When you come to that table, fix your eyes on Jesus. Remember your absolute position before the cross as a sinner saved by grace. And one last point. Might have seemed weird to you to have this laborer's story and then we just abruptly go from there to Jesus on the road to Jerusalem saying, so by the way, they are going to flog me, they're going to crucify me, they're going to kill me and then I will raise from the dead. And you're like, why did we need that information right now? We're still thinking about vineyards and we're trying to remember what a denarius is. And, but I think it actually does build on everything we've just been saying. If comparison robs our hearts of the joy and gratitude that we ought to have from the gospel, the joy and gratitude that ought to fuel our service. If we shouldn't be looking to the side, then where should our eyes go? They go on the mission. He gives them this negative picture, trying to get them to knock off what they have been doing since chapter 18, and spoiler alert, what they will do later in chapter 20. He's interrupting saying, no, here's where you need to be looking. You guys are so busy fighting over position, you don't realize we're going to Jerusalem so that I can die and raise. This is the mission of God. Stop looking at whether who gets to be on my right hand and who's the greatest and start looking at the mission of God. Let's go down this road together. Let's be passionate about God's plan in Jesus to save the world. Part of how you stop this relative comparison game is you remember what we're here for. Why would I resent someone else getting grace if that was the whole point of the thing, was to see people who don't deserve it get grace? You're telling me that there's families you know who are just total screw-ups and Jesus is blessing them by his grace? Praise God, the gospel made it into your friend group. There's people coming into our church and they still need to shape up and change their lives in a ton of areas and yet they're here and they're beloved and they're wanted. Praise God, the gospel is getting them. That was the mission. When you get your eyes and you focus on what's the mission, the grace of God come through Jesus, the very things that would annoy you actually are pictures of the victory God has. It's grace in our midst. God's mission is to save the world through Jesus. The mission is to see the unworthy receive grace. If the early laborers had known and loved the mission, they would have danced with joy when they saw the one-hour laborers get paid. Look at that. They made it. Just barely. We wanted to see them all get brought in. And a few more made it. What a victory for the grace of our master. So we don't want to get stuck as a church or as individuals comparing ourselves with other Christians or other congregations. We want to fix our eyes on the mission. This church exists because our master has invited us into his mission. We're here to see unworthy sinners be saved and discipled through the lavish grace of Jesus. So if you think someone here doesn't deserve to be, well, that's the whole point. None of us do. That's the mission. When the unworthy enter into the family of God, participate in the church community and receive his care, his provision, his aid, his grace and forgiveness, that just means we're on the right track. See, this, this is a sermon to me. 
As I said, I, I uh, put my faith in Christ at five years old. And, and it was real. I loved it. Still do. Got crazier as I got older. And by high school, I was launching out into full-time ministry. By the end of high school, I was in full-time ministry. I put in the whole day. Whenever God knocks me out and takes me home, it'll have been the full day's labor. And so I was raised inside the vineyard, inside the church. And I've got vineyard culture. I know how to fit in. I know the lingo. I know the songs. I mean, that... That song I introduced you to that we sang in the beginning, it's not in the hymnal we have over at St. Paul's, but it's in the Covenant hymnal, and I'm churchy enough, I know multiple hymnals. And have favorites, you know. I know how to dress, whether I do it or not. I know where to sit. I know what to sing. I've got an entitled mentality on the basis of culture and conformity. I know I belong here. None of that... None of that is mindful of the mission. It's a struggle when you grow up inside the vineyard is you forget the vineyard was here for a purpose and we had a mission. And so when someone comes in or when we serve people who don't match my church culture, I can resent them for the ways they're different, whether it's their clothes or their hobbies or maybe it's just that they sin in ways different than me. Because we tend to have the sins we're comfortable with church people failing at and the sins we're not comfortable with church people failing at. And so certain sins, you stay out there. Certain sins, we leave alone. Now, greed is generally acceptable in the church. There's a host of others that disqualify you. That's not a gospel disqualification. Jesus dies for the sins of the world and his blood is sufficient for all. That's the mission. That's the message. It's just culturally I'm comfortable with some things and not others. And so I can judge their weaknesses severely while passing over people who sin like me. And if my eyes aren't on the mission, those people will drive me nuts. When will they get with the program and become like me? Vote like me. Sing like me. Dress like me. Play the games that I approve of. It's fine to waste time, but we have to waste time in our culturally agreed upon ways. When my eyes on the mission, I'll think, why isn't my church and my personal testimony reaching the whole world? I would be worried if we're all like me because the gospel was for the whole world, right? Why is it getting locked up only into my culture? Why am I only able to share this message with people like me? If it goes to everybody. I got neighbors that I think are crazy and weird and different. Shouldn't the gospel be sufficient to bring them in? And shouldn't be the mission to be a church that brings in a whole bunch of people from everywhere. Meeting the grace of Jesus that every last person needs. I mean I've shared before. One of the things that encouraged me. I remember early on in Christ I was looking out. And there was only like 20 or 22 of us. And um, it was election year like we're coming into this year. And realizing that in that little gathering... Of the people I knew, their party affiliations, I knew that we had Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Libertarians, and Constitutional Party members. The length of that list compared to the total number of people in the room is impressive. Now, do I have political opinions? I bet you know I do. And so do you. And I'm, I'm not even saying that your faith shouldn't weigh into that. I think it should. But I think the gospel can save a Republican and a Democrat and an Independent and a Constitutional Libertarian the same way. Turns out they're all sinners in need of a Savior. And none of them needed less blood. No extra perks for your party affiliation. You come to Jesus by grace. And we believe the gospel should get out there and reach them all. We're not looking to be a place where we just find one group to save and let the rest go to hell. When we get our eye on the mission... I looked out and didn't say, oh my word, look at all those messed up voters in my church. I went, praise God, the gospel reaches all of us. And praise God that we're having a witness to the gospel that didn't get caged up on only my team. I think I'm actually the minority in our church because I'm like the one independent. <laughs> Here's your application. 
If I, if I can see the gospel that way, I rejoice when I see everybody coming in through the gospel. And so for us, I need to have God's heart for those people. How do you get your eyes focused on the mission? You pray for the mission. That person that annoys you because they're so wrong and stupid and backwards or crazy and eccentric or whatever you don't like because it's not you, pray for them. It's really hard to pray for people without getting God's heart for them. And then when you get God's heart for them, you'll care more about their salvation and their relationship with Jesus than whether or not they end up looking like you. The only way they should start looking like me is if I'm going towards Jesus too and we just both get closer to him. Thank God that you have people in your life so different that they bother you. It means you've got gospel opportunities for the whole world. Pray that God would give you his burden for the lost that are near you but are not like you. Pray for those people that you struggle with because God so loved the world, the world, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. That's the mission. Pray for it. Pray for it so you focus on it. And you allow grace to thrive in your heart and inspire your ministry and service and guard you from the competition and ingratitude. So we're called to be a people of grace, a people who are trusting, hoping in and focusing on God's promise that's based on his own generosity and provision, not the worthiness of those he invites into his blessing. That's our call for us as we walk this road of Lent and come into Easter. You want to celebrate what happened on that cross? This is what he was doing. So let me throw two questions up for you, and then I'll spend some time with the kiddos looking at the catechism. Um, questions, you can go off script if you need, but these were the two I thought of. One was just, so it's easy enough to say, hey, stop comparing yourself to others. Get your eyes on grace. But how do you do that? When you're struggling, right? You're sitting in a setting, and there's just that other person, and it's just sucking the life out of your ability to serve Christ. How do you recenter your heart on grace when you're struggling with comparison? Two, how can our families and groups foster regular prayer for and focus on God's mission? I know so many times I don't witness because I have not prayed for witness. My heart wasn't even open to it. There was opportunities. I just didn't even see them. So we want to be a people in our families, our gatherings, our groups a regular prayer for and focus on God's mission. How do we do that? How have you seen that in your life? How do you make those rhythms um, real and tangible?